Our next topic, which is whether the General Assembly will expand Maryland Medicaid to pay for gender affirming care and procedures for transgender patients is one that needs to be treated with great sensitivity and respect. There are strong opinions on both sides of the debate. And because of the subject, I want to present to you our audience for awareness and consideration. It's a topic that is in the headlines of many, many states and nationally. Uh, so let's talk about what we are in Maryland uh, approaching. Mara say there seems to be several avenues of discussion regarding this legislation. Is gender affirming care necessary? Should it be covered by Medicaid? Will it be available to children and minors? And is parental consent and participation required? As a former member of the House of Delegates, let's just focus first on whether the bill, whether gender affirming care is necessary and appropriate, and is Medicaid the right funding mechanism for the program? Thank you, Casey. Yes, actually, um, in 2014, when I was still a member of the legislature, we passed what was then the Senate Bill 212, the Fairness for All Marylanders Act, which identified transgender people as a protected class. And we basically just said, you know, this the, the Maryland Constitution and our services and all of our tax, pay, uh, tax paid for programs should not discriminate uh, uh, transgender folks in housing, employment, public accommodations, and credit. So all of this, what this new bill does, it just adds healthcare so that Medicaid, as you uh, correctly stated, Casey, could then cover for uh, certain gender affirming procedures and treatments. Now, the question is, the question you asked is if the procedures are necessary, but this bill does not say all transgender children should go and get uh, reaffirming um, treatments. What it's saying is that for uh, uh, an individual who is 16 and above, um, you know, should be able to get Medicaid uh, coverage for uh, such treatments. Um, and so when it comes to this specific population, uh, we know through our science, not through opinion, but through science um, and social science um, um, assessments, that this is a um, demographic that is highly uh, has high propensity to, for suicide. So anything that we can do as as Marylanders to close the gap in um, insurance care in terms of coverage, I'm all for it, and I'm very proud to have been part of the original cohort of, for, of folks that stood up for transgender Marylanders. And now seeing my colleagues such as Ann Kaiser and Bonnie Collison to continue this work, I can I couldn't be more proud. Well, thank you. Uh, Lori, you obviously uh, come from a different perspective because uh, you testified in opposition to the bill. So explain why, please. Yes, I represented the Montgomery County Federation of Republican Women in my testimony. Um, and I, I, I found out that, um, you know, I was concerned that that's actually discriminatory against everyone but trans, um, transgender people. Uh, but the state's attorney general, from what, what I understand, has stated it's not discriminatory for um, them to have transgender um, care. However, I don't buy that argument. Um, the bill would allow transgenders to store their sperm or eggs, but not anyone else. That Medicaid would pay for them, but not for anyone else. Uh, it also would change your, if, if you're, for example, a boy, a, a man who's bald, you could have um, hair transplant done to, to give yourself hair as a woman. Um, and you know, if you're, what if you're a bald man and you're not transgender, you can't get care covered by Medicaid. Uh, it also covers facial alterations, which means plastic surgery. Like if you want high cheekbones, like, um, uh, Caitlyn Jenner, you can have Medicaid cover that. But if I wanted high cheekbones, I will not be covered by Medicaid for that. Um, so it, I don't think it is fair for all people. It is, it, it, it favors transgenders. I'm sorry, but that's how I feel. And I think that that's, I think that it is discriminatory against everyone but transgender people. I do have compassion for them, but I think that care should be, healthcare should be equal to, um, to all uh, using, you know, circumstances that, I mean, you have to look at what's medically necessary. I don't think it's medically necessary to get high cheekbones. Um, it, you know, that doesn't make sense. Uh, also, I was concerned about the, um, Children, uh, it looks like this will open the door. This bill uh, will open the door for um, for more children to to have gender affirming care. 
Uh, and, you know, most studies have shown that a lot of studies show that most children change their mind when they become adults. So I don't think it's uh, in there. Are, and there's no therapeutic um, approaches that um, are evidence based. Um, so there's not enough data out there that really shows that therapeutic care will actually help that person. And, and if you look at the suicide rate, it's still extremely high for these, um, these people. They need care, but it's, it's I'm not sure that for children, this is the right kind of care. And I know well, that- I want to, I want to, thank you, Laurie. Yeah. I want to, I don't mean to cut you off, but Go I, ahead. We, we need to ex explore some of the things that, that you just brought up, which is there is a division of opinion in the uh, scientific community uh, between what is appropriate care and at what age. Uh, the AMA guidelines, uh, you know, does recognize gender dysphoria, and it says that as as a, you know, as determined by shared decision making between patient and physician, these are medically ne necessary as and uh, outlined by generally accepted standards of medical and surgical practices. Whereas the uh, endocrine society currently recommends that transgender youth wait until the age of eighteen to get genital surgery and shouldn't start gender affirming hormones prior to the age 16. Uh, Marissa, you mentioned in your, in your answer that the, the law is uh, uh, targeted uh, not to start until someone reaches the age of 16. So does this open the door to other minors having care or not? It wouldn't change anything that under um, the, the guidelines and licensing procedures for the, you know, for any medical professional to, to follow. Um, so it doesn't, you know, just expanding access to gap coverage under Medicaid, state Medicaid does not change what's already best practices um, and what would be a decision between a practitioner and their patient and their, and their, and their parents. Um, so in other words, if there's a federal guideline as to folks under the ages of 16 and a parent needs to be um, in the room or needs to be part of the part of the process, then nothing changes that. This is just an expansion in the, the state Medicaid program. And that's because we understand that the transgender community um, is highly uh, exposed to being rejected, harassed, and discriminated by society. So for you know uh, someone who wants to have high cheekbones for aesthetic reasons, that's not what an individual who has been born into um, a, a sex that they don't identify with will be suffering from by being discriminated, rejected, or harassed in the workplace or in public spaces. So um, I, I, you know, I, I continue to make this that same, the same argument that just expanding the coverage that what Medicaid has right now in the state of Maryland will not create these new, um, you know, new avenues for for I guess for children to be forced into, you know, a procedure that they don't want to, that they don't want to have um, with, with the support of their parents, without the support of their parents. Well, I, I want to, like I, I want to, I want to, I want to clarify something that, that you said, Marissa, and I don't know who's best to answer this. Um, the real key here and the real fear that ha people have is that minors will be able to um, enter into gender affirming care without parental consent and without parental knowledge. Will this bill open that Pandora's box? Either one of you. I don't know the who is best. Yeah, in and I don't know, but I I, I think what's most important is uh, I don't I'm a, I think that the legislators are so worried about looking not the, uh, looking insensitive that they're not looking at the facts and and uh, like if you look at the fiscal notes, it just stares at it. I mean, it's going to be so much more expensive. It will add signif a significant amount to Medicaid expenditures. Um, we can't afford this right now. I mean, this, this is, this is uh, ridiculous that they're not even, they don't even seem to have read the fiscal notes. There's so much information in there that, and I'm sure that there's even more that could be said, <laughs> but I, I just um, am very concerned uh, about this. Well, I think, I, I mean, fiscal considerations are important, but I think also people recognize that if there is, there is a legitimate need for health care, that we, we try to find a way to provide it. There seems to be, the, however, a large debate all sur surrounding gender affirming care as to the best approach that is taken um, in providing that health care. So um, I appreciate both of you uh, 
joining this difficult topic. And so stay tuned for Parting Shots. Mm -hmm.